it's on now. So let us start the um, morning session. And the first speaker of the morning is Lance Dixon. He's going to talk about unveiling the structure of amplitudes in gauge theory and gravity. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity to present this review. This excellent conference being held at the very center of the universe, at least the center of the particle physics universe, at the LHC is starting to operate. Uh, what I wanted to tell you about today was to just give you a brief uh, introduction to uh, the notion of uh, amplitudes and, and trying to study things via amplitudes, scattering amplitudes, on-shell scattering amplitudes. And then I'll describe some tools that go into making these calculations possible. And then I'll discuss some of the applications and uh, I was originally sort of asked to review ADS-CFT and N equals 8 supergravity from field theory perspectives, but I couldn't resist being here and all, uh, adding uh, QCD for the LHC to the topic. Uh, also, there's a lot of unity between some of the tools that are being developed for these applications and the latter applications. Now, in the case of uh, N equals 4 super Yang mills and the connection to ADS-CFT, there are at least three more talks in this conference coming up on this topic. So I will introduce some of the things, but maybe not say too much, because they'll be covered in much greater detail. And in the case of N equals 8 supergravity, well, we already heard a little from Renata Kalosh, and uh, we'll probably hear more from Freddy Cachazo and uh, Michael Green. And then I'll conclude. So scattering amplitudes are really completely basic to almost everything we learn directly from collider experiments. And so they're an important source of information about experimental reality in the world around us. But they've also proved extremely useful over the years in doing uh, not just real experiments, but Gedanken experiments, and probing the properties of theories, and learning about the structure of theories, as well as the structure of the amplitudes within those theories. And the fact that they're on shell makes them, and all the information you get out of them, physical independent of field redefinitions, for example, in the case of identifying counterterms, independent of gauge choice. And it also often lends them a lot of simplicity. And so, as I was saying, sometimes you can find hidden structures in amplitudes which you only start to understand fully 
later on. And the canonical example of that in the field I've been involved with are these maximally helicity violating tree amplitudes, which were uh, written down in the uh, mid 1980s, and they were observed to be extremely si simple for an arbitrary number of outgoing gluons, as long as you chose the first non vanishing helicity configuration, where two of the gluons were negative and the remaining ones were positive. And although they were very simple and you could understand some of their properties, they also provided a key to the development of a new way of thinking about uh, QCD amplitudes, that is twister string theory. Now I'm gonna, not going to follow uh, the specific developments of twister string theory in detail in this talk, but they actually gave a lot of impetus for people to take a fresh look at how these amplitudes are arranged and what kind of structures they have. Now amplitudes are not perfect. If I could design amplitudes, I would try to do it in such a way that they didn't have infrared divergences because they're often a technical pain. But uh, they're also very physical divergences. And uh, we know a lot, a lot about how to deal with them. Thanks to a lot of work that's been done in uh, QED and QCD that can often be extrapolated to cases like N equals 4 super Yang mills. And I'm not going to say a lot about these details, but basically you can factorize these infrared divergences into contributions of very soft gluons at the longest wavelengths. That's what this red blob represents. Connecting together um, hard lines. And the hard lines are not sort of single quanta, but they can be clusters of virtual quanta moving collinear. And so all the collinear divergences can be absorbed into uh, these things here, which are called jet functions, because they sort of resemble a, a virtual jet of particles. Um, and anyway, this structure has been very well understood, and, and you can actually exploit that in uh, th theories such as n equals 4 super Yang mills, as well as in QCD. And in QCD, to actually get numbers out, we have to exploit this structure as well in order to uh, develop a way of canceling virtual and uh, real divergences for generic processes at colliders. Now, probably the most important thing I wanted to tell you today is this notion that amplitudes are plastic. Now, we often just refer to these properties as analyticity, but if you think of them as blobs of putty, it makes it a lot more concrete somehow. And so many of these things are, are known, especially to string theorists, because they're, they're well understood from that perspective. But uh, in the context of field theory, they can also be used in very powerful ways. So the first example is the example of a, a tree amplitude. And we can think of it as a blob of putty, and deforming it corresponds to changing the uh, various momenta around, making some of them closer to each other, further apart, so on. By going into particular regions in this parameter space of the different kinematic invariants, we can make the amplitude fall apart into disconnected pieces, two different disconnected pieces. For example, if we take that top cluster of momenta to be almost light-like, have their sum be almost light-like, then this scattering process becomes disconnected from this one. They could happen arbitrarily far away. And so the amplitude must decompose or factorize into a product of lower point tree amplitudes. And those are, that's basically the type of limit you have available to you in the case of tree amplitudes with different numbers of legs on either side. But at the loop level, you, of course, have, besides poles in various channels, you also have branch cuts. And uh, so unitarity tells you what the discontinuities are across branch cuts. And you can uh, think about this in terms of a kind of putty, too, where you pull apart this ring into two different blobs. And, and what you're doing there is you're separating it into processes now separated at a long distance in space time with two almost asymptotic states going across the cut. But you can, you can go further than this, too, and uh, we'll get back to that later. But the basic idea is to exploit this plasticity or analyticity in order to determine amplitudes. Now, another tool that's very important is the helicity formalism. Because as we've seen, when we go to particular helicity cases, we find very simple expressions. Not all of the helicity amplitudes are equally simple, but we can understand a lot of their properties best once we write them down in the helicity basis. Besides the, this uh, MHV sequence, 
of amplitudes, maximal helicity violating. There were also observed early on that there were ones that just vanished, where you had either zero negative helicities or one negative helicity. Now, helicity, of course, is another word for circular polarization. Right-handed circular polarization is helicity plus one, and left hand is helicity minus one. So now I'd like to interrupt this physics seminar for a short biology lesson. This is to tell you about a creature called the mantis shrimp, which lives in Indonesia. Biologists found that it reflected left and right circularly polarized light differently. So then they thought, well, maybe it actually can see it differently. So it turns out that its eyes actually have differential sensitivity. You may remember from physics lab the quarter wave plate, which converts circular polarization to linear polarization. And that's present in the eye of this critter. So it's actually communicating, in some sense, via the helicity formalism. And so the biologists have, uh, this one here has uh, said, it's the most private communication system imaginable. No other animal can see it. Well, that's where they were wrong, because particle theorists have also evolved the capability <laughs> to communicate results via the helicity formalism. And what's more, they're surrounded by a lot of experimentalists, especially at CERN, and the LHC experimentalists <laughs> are really blind to it, because their protons are coming in unpolarized, so that, that means that the quarks are coming in unpolarized, and if there were any polarization generated at short distances at the amplitudes, it'd pretty much be washed out by the long distance physics, especially fragmentation. So it's, it's really hard to see these polarization events, at least in purely hadronic events at the LHC. And what that actually means in practice to the particle theorists, well, first of all, the experimentalists don't know what they're talking about when they're talking about particular helicity amplitudes. They want unpolarized cross sections. So that means that in the end, you, if you want to do something of practical use, you have to get, have a way to get every single helicity configuration, not just these MHV ones, because you have to sum over them to give something useful to the experimentalists. So now there's an even advanced, more advanced communication mechanism, which is called the spinner helicity formalism. And in that one, uh, the states not only are labeled by helicities, but everything is really written in terms of, of vial spinners, spin a half, uh, uh, objects, and uh, they're often in various textbooks written as U plus or U minus, but in the, uh, say, uh, more recent literature, people have been writing them labeled by the uh, leg I only, corresponding to the momentum Ki. And then instead of describing the scattering amplitude in terms of Lorentz products, you use these spinner products or the uh, uh, Lorentz invariant combinations of these uh, with the two index anti-symmetric tensor of these two spinners. So these are the angle and square brackets that uh, say Stefan Stieberger and Renata Kallo showed earlier. And they have this uh, important property which is that they are, when you multiply two of them together, you get back the Lorentz invariant Sij and that's just the uh, square of it, Ki plus Kj or the dot product of Ki and Kj, because we're thinking of the case where all the external particles are massless here. So Ki squared and Kj squared are zero. So they obey this relation, and if the momenta were, are real, then uh, this Sij would be real, and these would be complex square roots of the Sij's. But uh, it's very important in this game to think about continuing the momenta to complex values. And the real reason for doing this, or, or one of the most important reasons for doing this, is that it makes it possible to write down a fundamental building block for all amplitudes in gauge theory, which is a three-point scattering amplitude. Now, if all the momenta are uh, real, this uh, amplitude actually is completely sick. It doesn't make any sense. And the reason is a kinematic one. If you solve these equations for uh, Sij, that's Ki plus Kj squared, that's also the third momentum squared, that's zero. For all these dot products to vanish with real momenta, they must be collinear. That's a singular configuration where all possible kinematic invariants vanish. So you just can't write anything down. But if you go to these complex momenta, then you break the fact that these are square roots of Sij. And what that means is that for Sij to be zero, 
you can actually still have one set of them be non-zero. So you can take the angle brackets to be non-zero, for example, and the square brackets to vanish. And th in that case, at least for particular helicity choices, you can make sense out of a three gluon amplitude. In fact, it's just the limit of that Park-Taylor formula we saw earlier for the case n equals three. And uh, if you want to make sense of the opposite helicity configuration, you choose a little bit different complex kinematics where these are non-vanishing and these are vanishing. Okay, so armed with those tools of the helicity formalism and the notion of complex momenta, you can now try to use this factorization information to build up amplitudes from scratch. And that was done uh, very elegantly by Rito, Kachazo, Feng, and Witten um, over three years ago. And they uh, <coughs> pointed out that you can now embed the amplitudes into a one parameter complex family of amplitudes by shifting the spinner variables that also characterize the momenta in a particular way. In such a, the simplest such shift is one that only affects two of the legs in this endpoint amplitude, and you inject some momentum in here and remove it here. And as you move around in the complex plane, there are various poles that just correspond to these different ways of factorizing the uh, amplitude at shifted momenta. And the fact that it's complex lets you solve, find these poles, or have poles for different such channels. And the residue of each pole is uh, <coughs> given in terms of lower point amplitudes. And so you can build the amplitudes, tree amplitudes up recursively in this way. You can use Cauchy's theorem. And there's a key point about uh, making sure that you know what the amplitude does at infinity so that you don't have to worry about the term from doing the contour integral out here. But I'll gloss over that here. So when you do this analysis then of Cauchy's theorem, you get that the original endpoint amplitude at z equals zero is a sum over residues at these other points in the z-plane. And each residue, when you work it out, is just the product of these two tree amplitudes connected by a scalar propagator. And you should allow for the different possible helicities that can go down this pipe. And uh, these amplitudes end up being evaluated not for a real momenta. Well, these momenta are real. But these guys are at some fixed complex point near that residue right at the residue. And so this is a very environmentally correct way to compute because you're recycling. You're recycling trees into more complicated trees. And to see how environmentally correct or efficient it is, we could just look at one example, which is a six gluon example. We already have formulas for MHV amplitudes where you have two negative helicity or, or two positive helicity. But the case where you have three plus and three minus is non-trivial. And it turns out you really only need one other non-trivial assignment, and that works similarly. But this case here, basically, you would have to worry about 220 Feynman diagrams if you want to get the com complete uh, color structure and helicity structure of this. But for this case, in terms of these recursive diagrams, you might write down three diagrams. You immediately find that, say, this one vanishes uh, because of one of those vanishing tree amplitudes. And you get just two diagrams left over. They're even related by a symmetry. So it's a very simple calculation. Each of those two diagrams gives you one of the two terms in this expression. And they're written very compactly in terms of these spinner products, certain uh, Mandelstam invariants, and some combinations of spinner products. And this formula, not only is it very compact, but it's, it's almost perfect. That is, it has just about the, the right behavior in various limits when leg three and leg four become parallel, you see a particular singularity here and another one here, and those are exactly the right physical singularities. There is one spurious singularity, that is this thing has a, this term has a pole in a particular region when this vanishes, but it's pretty mild, it's just one power and it's canceled by, by another term. So this is basically the fine, simplest form anybody's found for these and it just comes out naturally from this uh, formalism. So now we want to move on to loop amplitudes. And I guess I was watching too much uh, diving on the Olympics, so I decided to ascribe some degrees of difficulty. So there's a conference called Loops and Legs. So basically, if you do one more loop or you do one more leg, you get invited to this conference. 
And uh, so that indicates that the degree of difficulty is a strong function of the number of loops. Although I've just put one factor in here. And coincidentally, five loops is like up at the top there. So, but then there's also legs. And uh, it's a strong function of the number of legs as well. So, and in fact, if you want to do a lot of loops and a lot of legs, the only thing that can save you is to have a lot of supersymmetries, because otherwise it's just too hard. And then, of course, this is not a completely objective uh, sport. There's a style factor involved, and different people have different style factors. For me, if you compute something that you can measure in an experiment, you get a big style factor. But other people have different, different uh, criteria. So uh, now we can start to just scan this, uh, I could say landscape, I guess, of, uh, of results, uh, and uh, just mention sort of where the state of the art is. So when we talk about things that are really already setting benchmarks in terms of experimental measurements, you can't forget G minus two, which is at about four loops, and it's sort of about two or three legs, depending on how you count. And of course, there's the classic work by Kinoshita, and some, of it, some pieces are going up around five loops now. Then in QCD, there is a recent progress on doing the quantity that enters the E plus E minus to hadron ratio, or the Z to hadrons, by Bykoff and collaborators up around five loops. So that's uh, pretty impressive stuff. And uh, this actually goes into the determination of the QED fine structure constant alpha, and this one into the QCD coupling constant alpha s. Then there's another extreme, which is QCD with, at one loop, but with lots of external legs. And I'll say more about this later, but there are a number of different groups who have been using uh, some of these techniques exploiting analyticity to try to build up these, uh, these results for multi-parton amplitudes with a lot of legs. And then there's this region in between with lots of loops and lots of legs. And here you see the results are typically with lots of supersymmetries, too. And so this addresses this issue of what sorts of things can you do in n equals four super Yang mills, and we'll say a little more about what you learn once you've done them. And then uh, there's been some additional calculations recently up to the five-point five amplitude at three loops. And uh, then uh, in order to address certain uh, conjectures, uh, the two-loop amplitudes were computed at five and then six uh, legs. And then finally, there's the case of n equals eight supergravity, which actually this formula is wrong. It doesn't make it uh, any easier, but you get an extra factor of two for including gravitons, which cancels the eight for uh, supergravity. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the uh, n equals eight uh, supergravity amplitudes, there's been work both in trying to understand the structure, if not give the actual values for arbitrarily many legs, in the context of something called the no triangle hypothesis or property, and also in the multi-loop direction in order to try to address ultraviolet cancellations in this theory. So the first uh, topic is uh, the case of QCD multi-parton loop amplitudes. And the question is, why do we want to do this? And the answer is very simple, because the LHC is a QCD machine. It's bags of quarks and gluons colliding. And uh, you're going to look for new physics in there, but there are huge standard model backgrounds. And they may have uh, uh, some Ws and Zs or Higgses in them, but they often come along with, with many quarks and gluons of QCD. And so you need to understand how to calculate scattering amplitudes for many of these massless particles in uh, effectively massless gauge theory. And in some cases, you may be able to get, get away quite well with leading order calculations, but these can have uncertainties up to a factor of two sometimes. And so you'd like to see if you can control them by working at the next order in alpha s in the uh, QCD coupling constant. And to go to this order, you need two things. You need to calculate virtual loop corrections, and you also need the corresponding real radiation, which uh, cancels against it. The singularities cancel. But here I'm just talking about the uh, issue of getting the loop amplitudes. Just one quick example of where you might need it, which was also mentioned by Oliver Bookmiller on Monday, was the search for, quote, supersymmetry, or anything with uh, produces missing energy in a number of jets because of some cascade decay. 
the Susie example would be a gluino which cascades down to a neutralino, and that gives you missing energy. But you can also produce a Z with four jets, and when the Z decays to neutrinos, that gives you missing energy too. And that one is shown in red, and for a particular point in SUSY parameter space, the SUSY signal is shown in black. But there's actually an uncertainty on this red curve. And if you don't control it better, you can worry that you're not going to be able to uh, see this little thing sticking up. So the, uh, the goal is to calculate some of these processes at higher orders. But for this process, it's a pretty tall task. It actually turns out to be two legs beyond the state of the art. And that's the case that goes into producing a Z plus four jets at next to leading order, along with many other hundreds of other diagrams. And there's a really strong growth in complexity as you go up in the, the number of legs. So if you consider just the gluon uh, processes where I know the, the numbers, they grow quite substantially. And these three million numbers are plenty of motivation for trying to exploit the analyticity of amplitudes at one loop. So uh, for that purpose, it turns out we can make use of a, of a way of decomposing the amplitude that helps us uh, pick off its, its different components more efficiently. So we can define an amplitude as having a part that has cuts in it, which we call the cut part, and then a part that is just rational functions of the momenta, which we call the rational part. And it turns out that the cut part can actually be de decomposed into products of more rational functions, these coefficients here, multiplied by particular scalar integrals. And these scalar integrals are ones you would probably expect, bubbles and triangles and boxes. But what's kind of interesting is there aren't any pentagons or hexagons. I'll mention a reason for that a little bit later. But let's just take this for granted for the moment. And uh, we know what all these integrals are, basically. They're process independent. You can work them out once and for all. So if you have a given process, the task is to, is to calculate these coefficients of the boxes, coefficients of the triangles, and coefficient of the bubbles, and then this rational part. So these are all known. And uh, the way to get these rational functions are to use a generalization of that uh, two-particle unitarity that we were looking at before. So, in fact, here's that uh, way of deforming this loop into two blobs, putting two particles on shell. But we can just as easily deform it a little bit further and put three particles on shell and to generate a, a triple cut, because these are just blobs of putty after all. We can uh, impose three conditions where all three of these particles are on the mass shell. Now, in this case, these could be real momenta at least if you were above threshold for scattering. These are m much more typically, although not always, uh, satisfied for complex momenta. And, but it's OK. You can actually uh, compute them as if you were in the real physical regime. The coefficients don't really care about that. And, uh, but you do have to put complex momenta along these various cut lines generically. And the second point is that the reason why you would like to do this is that the trees get simpler. In the same way that we saw that it was worth factorizing a complicated tree into a simple tree, that's obviously going to give you benefits when you do it inside a uh, loop. So the uh, case where you're trying to work out the coefficients of these box integrals was studied by Brito, Cachazo, and Feng. And they found that, uh, in this case, you split the thing into four blobs, or four product of four tree amplitudes. And if you want an equation for it, you have a product of four delta functions. And, and then the, uh, when you impose these cuts on the loop, you pick off a single box coefficient, because there's only one box that has the cuts in exactly the right place. And that box coefficient is equal to the product of trees evaluated at the solutions to these four equations. Now, because there's four equations, and because we're in four dimensions, the number of equations equals the number of unknowns. And so we expect discrete solutions, and we get generally two discrete solutions. And that's a very simple way to compute a unique box coefficient. Notice also that if we tried to put in a fifth cut, generically we wouldn't be able to do it unless there was something singular about the kinematics. And that's 
in effect, an explanation of why there are no pentagons in that expansion of the amplitude. Because if there were a pentagon and it weren't reducible to boxes, you would have found a, a fifth solution. So that doesn't happen when you're doing scatterings with the external particles in four dimensions. Now, you can go on, and in the case of n equals 4 super Yang mills, it actually turns out that you're done. There is nothing but boxes. In the case of QCD, though, you also have triangle and bubble coefficients to compute. And they're a little bit more complicated because a single uh, double or triple cut doesn't isolate a single coefficient. If you try to isolate this triangle, because there are boxes around, they also have triple cuts. They just have one propagator that hasn't been cut. And so you have to re remove the effects of these boxes. And when you go to bubbles, you have to remove the effects of the boxes and the triangles. And there are also solutions to the cut constraints that are now continuous. And that continuous number of solutions gives you the information to remove the triangles, the boxes and boxes and triangles. And so all of this stuff has now actually been implemented in, in codes to do QCD calculations. There's one last piece, which is the rational function. If you're applying all of these cuts with four-dimensional momenta, you actually can't see this piece because, by definition, it doesn't have any cuts. It's a rational function. However, we know that the amplitude really has a small fractional dimension that must be carried by some variable. And if we expand that variable out, we see that at order epsilon, you develop a cut. And so if you can actually do this unitarity a little more accurately in 4 minus 2 epsilon dimensions, in dimensional regularization, then you can extract these rational parts. And so there's been a lot of developments along those lines, and some of these QCD codes are based on, on this technique. We've been working on a little different way of getting these rational functions, where we want to use the same tree-level plasticity. That is, we want to write down a recursion relation by doing the same shifts that Brito, Cachazo, Feng, and Witten did at tree level. And uh, when we do that, well, if we did it on the full amplitude, we would have cuts to worry about. And then we can't use Cauchy's theorem. We can actually apply it, though, just to the rational part of the amplitude. Then, by definition, we don't have any cuts. We just have poles. Turns out we have a few extra poles, because some of these poles cancel against the cut parts in the full amplitude. But we know the cut parts, so we know how to take that into account. So, and then the physical poles, the one in blue, they give us some recursive diagrams that are very much like the kinds you get at tree level. And so in this case, and also in this case of generalized unitarity, you see that trees and sometimes trees plus loops, that information gets recycled into more complicated loops. So you can actually execute this and build up uh, more state-of-the-art uh, uh, programs for computing these complicated one-loop uh, processes. For example, there's a package called Cut Tools that has been used to calculate the production, not of the World Wide Web, but of three electroweak vector bosons at the LHC, at next to leading order. Uh, there's a program called Rocket, which has actually produced one-loop n-gluon amplitudes for n up to 20. And we have a pack, uh, program called Black Hat, which uh, produces n-gluon amplitudes for n up to 7 at the moment, and also some of the amplitudes needed for the next leading order production of Z plus 3 jets, which will get us one step closer to that SUSY background I mentioned. Okay, so now I'd like to switch gears and go to the multi-leg and multi-loop frontier. And as I mentioned, um, in order to uh, make progress if, if all you want to do is push the number of legs and number of loops, you need some assistance from the much simpler structure of amplitudes in maximally supersymmetric theories. N equals 4 for gauge theory and N equals 8 for supergravity. And uh, these maximally supersymmetric theories have a lot of interest in the former case because of the ADS-CFT correspondence and in the uh, latter case for questions of ultraviolet finiteness and how the theory is behaving. And uh, they're actually related technically, too, because progress in n equals 4 turns out to lead to progress in n equals 8, thanks to certain relations found by Kawhi, Llewellyn, and Tai using string theory, certain relations between the tree-level scattering amplitudes in the two theories. But let's uh, just discuss in general how you might use generalized unitarity at the multi-loop level. 
And uh, the most convenient thing to do is to work with tree amplitudes only. And if you take an ordinary cut, for example, there's a cut of the three loop amplitude that goes through these three particles, and it leaves behind a one loop amplitude. And this guy's a bit complicated, so what would be a lot better is if we could cut it in turn in all inequivalent in ways into trees. And when you do that cut, there are three of these uh, secondary cuts that you can do, and you find that you can, all the information that's in this amplitude is really in its cuts, and so all the information that's in this cut is in these sets of generalized cuts. So if you can evaluate these, and if you have a, a onsatz for the amplitude that agrees with these, then it matches this cut. And in general, all you really have to do is consider appropriate products of, of trees like this, sufficient set of them. But actually, that, that's a type of, these are cuts that can actually be saturated in real momenta. You can have two particles scattering to three particles, scattering back to two, and you can find real momentum configurations for most of these. But, but you can actually do better in the same way that at one loop, you can uh, impose more cut conditions. And when you allow for complex momenta everywhere, you can continue to dissolve this thing in like uh, in the fewer, more and more blobs of putty. And the best thing you can do is to resolve these all the way down to three-point vertices. And that's why it's so important that with complex momenta, we, can, we have these physical three-point vertices. And, and they're very simple. So, so you, uh, the starting point really is typically to evaluate cuts like this, which are in one language called maximal cuts, and they're closely related to uh, something called leading singularities in another language. And uh, the advantage is that these cuts are really maximally simple. And uh, for example, the corresponding supergravity cut will be really the precise square of the uh, Yang-Mills cut for these cases. So they're very simple, and yet they're an excellent starting point for building the full answer in these maximally supersymmetric theories. Just for example, if you do the uh, case of planar or leading color n equals four super Yang mills for the four point amplitude, you get all terms in the complete answer for up to three loops. Only at the four loop level do you miss something by this kind of an approximation. To find the missing terms after you've satisfied those previous conditions, then you can do a couple of things. One thing you can do is to relax away by letting a couple of those three-point vertices uh, reform into a four-point blob, or maybe a five-point blob. And so this shows some examples of some what we call near-maximal cuts that have a four-point blob, or in some cases a five-point blob. And, and so they're close to maximal, and they provide additional information that turns out to be sufficient to find all such all extra terms in either non-planar n equals four super Yang mills or n equals eight supergravity at three loops. And then there's a complementary approach, which uh, I believe Freddy Cachazo will talk about soon, so I won't go into any detail, but you can also uh, continue along the line of, of a concept of the leading singularity, but some of the singularities are a little bit hidden, that is you cannot see them as individual propagators here, and, but there's a singularity in this channel uh, Q plus K1 going here, and by imposing consistency conditions in this channel, you can also get uh, information that allows you to fix more terms. And so that's uh, very useful. And then there's also been some recent advances, and there's uh, actually a, another paper by Drummond, Hen, Korchemsky, and Sokachev and also one by Elvang, Friedman, and Kiermaier that, uh, that will help in doing supersymmetry sums that come up in more complicated cuts. In these simpler cuts, the amplitudes that you need are typically only MHV because they have at, we, at worst four particle blobs or five particle blobs. But in, in trying to check the full answer, you need to uh, have uh, non-MHV amplitudes and so on and sum over whole supermultiplets. So the application to planar n equals four super Yang mills and ADS CFT uh, is one I will touch on a few things. If you're, you're interested in this subject, there's a very nice review that was recently written by Fernando Alde and Radu Roybon, uh, 
And as I said, there are going to be some uh, more talks on this subject later in the conference. But the uh, basic idea of looking at planar n equals 4 super Yang mills is probably well known to, to many of you that because of the ADS CFT correspondence, um, in this limit, if we could also go to strong coupling, then we would have a weakly coupled gravity or string theory on uh, ADS5 cross S5, that is a large ADS5. And then the theory should become semi-classical. So one question we were trying to understand is how could that kind of simplicity show up in the weak coupling perturbation series for this uh, theory in terms of these uh, scattering amplitudes? And uh, by looking at these scattering amplitudes, a few different uh, properties started to come out. And uh, one of them was a pretty interesting exponentiation of finite terms in the amplitude. And uh, this was conjectured for arbitrary MHV amplitudes, and it turns out to be right for the 4 and 5 gluons, and not right beyond 5. There is also a uh, property that cropped up first at the level of integrals, and then at the level of amplitudes, called dual conformal invariance, which has very recently been extended to dual superconformal invariance, as Emery Sokachev will, will tell us. And then finally, there's a, a kind of very interesting equivalence between amplitudes, at least MHV amplitudes, and Wilson lines. And some of these things are starting to become understood, but there's still a lot of mysteries around. So one notion is exponentiation. I mentioned earlier that we understand how infrared singularities exponentiate in QED. In QCD, they also exponentiate, but it's a little bit more complicated. But this was all worked out uh, up through the 80s and 90s by a lot of work in QCD. And using that work and applying it to the simpler, much simpler case of planar supersymmetric Yang mills, it was possible to then use some explicit calculations at two and three loops and uh, propose an onsatz, that's with uh, Svi Byrne and Volodya Smirnov, an onsatz for the form of, this, of the scattering amplitudes. And we first proposed it for arbitrary MH maximal helicity violating amplitudes. So this is a uh, onsatz in which there are a number of functions here. This is the atuft parameter. And here is a counting of the loop order, L. And then there are some functions that are independent of the kinematics. This one has three terms in an epsilon expansion, so it's really, think of it as three constants. And there's one more constant here. And these, by constants, I mean that they're independent of the scattering angles, independent of the kinematics. And all the kinematic dependence is carried by the known one-loop amplitude after you divide by the tree. So that's kind of a, a general uh, guess or onsatz. In the case of n equals 4, it uh, boils down to because of working out this one-loop amplitude, that the uh, amplitude up to some constant, the finite part of it, is just the exponential of something times the uh, log squared of s over t involving the scattering angle. And this constant is called the cusp anomalous dimension. So this uh, prediction then was confirmed at strong coupling using uh, techniques that Fernando Alde will describe later uh, over on the string side of the correspondence. It was confirmed directly by n equals 4, and there's some indirect arguments that it's likely to work for n equals 5, but we'll see it definitely fails for n greater than 5. So these constants, well, actually, there's one at each loop order, or it's a function of the coupling, and uh, two of them are sort of well known in the QCD community because they control the infrared poles of amplitudes. And the other two don't have any good interpretation yet, but maybe they will someday. These guys definitely have some nice operator interpretations. One of them is the cusp anomalous dimension and is well known to a uh, uh, subgroup of string theorists because as the, it's also the leading spin dependence of the twist two anomalous dimensions and there's a very likely to be correct proposal for it due to Beisert, Eden, and Staudacher. So you could say that one of these four constants, these three Fs and C, is already known. And uh, this is the next one to attack, I think, the collinear anomalous dimension. So if all four of these could be determined, you could say we would have an exact four-point scattering amplitude. <coughs> 
in a uh, four-dimensional field theory, which would be quite nice. Four minus epsilon dimensional field theory. So th there's this exponential structure of amplitudes in N equals four super Yang mills. And then another notion which uh, will be expanded on in these talks by Nathan Berkowitz and Emery Sokachev is that of dual conformal invariance. So this was a very strange observation at first by Drummond, Hen, Smirnoff, and Sokachev. And it, they were analyzing the properties of the specific loop integrals that show up in these multi-loop super Yang Mills calculations. Here I'll just show you how it works on the simplest of the, those, the one loop amplitude. The one loop amplitude is a scalar box integral and it has some constant in the numerator that depends on S and T or K1, square, K1 plus K2 squared and uh, K2 plus K3 squared in the numerator. And then these are just the four scalar denominators. So the idea is to try to find a conformal symmetry that acts not in position space, but in momentum space. Now the conformal, special conformal generators correspond to inversion and then translation and then inversion. So it's sufficient to study the properties of this under inversion. But you can't invert the, the k squareds. First of all, ki squared is zero. And second of all, momentum conservation has to be maintained. So what it's possible to do, they realized, was to uh, write some dual or sector variables that live in these regions here. Okay, and the way they're defined is so that the difference between adjacent regions corresponds to the line that you crossed. So between uh, x4 and x1 is k1, and so the difference of x4 and x1 is k1, and so on. And then the loop momentum is replaced by x5, and its difference here between the different xi's correspond to these propagators in the sense of these dual graphs. And then what you find if you re rewrite the integral in this form, it's invariant under inversion. It's a very simple thing to check. And, uh, and because it's so simple, there are graphical rules for when an integral is invariant. And basically the rule is that you should have a net of four lines coming out of an inter internal vertex and some fixed number of lines, say one, coming out of an external vertex. So if that just happened for the one loop uh, amplitude, it might be written off as an accident, but it happens for the two loop integral, two loop amplitude, three loop amplitude, four loop amplitude. Here's the example of the four loop amplitude. The four loop planar amplitude for four gluon scattering remarkably can be written in, all, in terms of only eight different integrals. And each one of them can be decorated in such a way that every inside guy has uh, four lines coming out of it and every outside guy has the same fixed number, say one, coming out of it. These dotted lines are numerator factors. Sometimes they're just external momenta. In other cases, they represent loop momenta in a particular way in the internal part of the diagram. And the point is that this dual conformal invariance is completely consistent with this picture. In fact, if you assume it, all you really have to do is determine various constants in the middle of the, that, that multiply these integrals. In fact, this same structure has been checked at five loops as well. And uh, so it works there too. Now, where did this dual conformal invariance come from? Well, as a property not of integrals, but actually of, of full amplitudes, it was uh, argued to come at strong coupling at least from a certain t-dual symmetry of ADS5 cross S5. And, uh, and at the same time, and this came in the work of Aldi and Maldacena, which we'll hear about later, the strong coupling calculation was argued to be equivalent to a computation of a particular Wilson line. And the Wilson line actually has vertices at exactly these dual variables. Now, one of the, there's still a lot of puzzles going on here for future work, and one of them is exactly how this correspondence works, because like the LHC experimentalist, the poor Wilson line is blind to the helicity formalism. It really just knows about momenta. It doesn't know what polarizations are uh, there. And so there's additional information in the string calculation that needs to be provided in order to sort of cover all the different cases. <laughs>
but th that's work in progress, I believe. So um, surprisingly, this dual conformal invariance and Wilson line equivalence, at least it was surprising at first, that uh, it persists to weak coupling because the original argument was kind of a strong coupling argument. So these groups showed how things work for one loop amplitudes um, at the MHV, MHV configurations and then there were, was further work at two loops. And Emery will discuss the extension to dual superconformal invariance, which is clearly of relevance for non-MHV amplitudes. And Nathan will discuss uh, a new T-duality, including fermionic uh, transformations, that is better in the sense that it leaves the dilaton fixed and promises to really explain everything at uh, weaker coupling as well. Now, when you go to the uh, case of more than four gluons, the onsatz was known to work at two loops for n equals five. And then if you assume this dual conformal invariance, you could argue that it worked to all loops. And the reason is that this was enough to fix the structure of the five-point amplitude. At n equals six, you can't use this invariance to fix the six-point amplitude because there are certain invariants that you can build that are not transformed by the dual conformal symmetry. So there was uh, an issue that things were not so determined at n equals six, and there was actually some explicit uh, indications that the amplitudes might, uh, the onsatz might break down at this point. Some of it came from high energy or Reggie limits. Some came from a strong coupling large n calculation. Some came from a Wilson line calculation. So then uh, two groups calculated the two loop uh, answer for uh, six gluons, the even terms and the odd terms. And uh, although this is very reminiscent of organic chemistry, they're really dual conformal integrals. And what was found was that the onsatz definitely breaks down at n equals six. There's some unknown remainder function. It's known numerically at a few points, but not much else is known about it. And although it broke down, this dual conformal invariance still persisted as well as the equivalence to Wilson loops, which were calculated by these people. So there's clearly still more structure to be unveiled. So in my remaining three minutes, I'm going to tell you whether all about n equals eight supergravity, but because of lack of time, I not, might not be able to tell you whether it's finite or not. <laughs> okay, so actually, I, I believe Freddie Cachazzo is going to say some words about the multi-leg issues in n equals eight supergravity. Let me just say there's been a lot of interest in proving a certain no triangle hypothesis and uh, Freddie and also Bjorn Bohr and Van Hove have, have uh, given different proofs with different techniques. A uh, proof that Freddie uses is very similar to these triple cuts and also exploits factorization behavior of trees. And the property is a property that says that in some ways, n equals eight supergravity at one loop looks very much like n equals four super Yang mills. I mentioned that that theory is made up completely of boxes, and that's what the no triangle property for n equals eight supergravity asserts. And this is one way of learning about uh, the ultraviolet properties of, of n equals eight supergravity because you can probe many different vertices as you go, go around this loop. But probably a more direct way to do it is to go to the multi-loop case. And uh, in this case, we can use these Kawhi, Llewellyn, and Tai relations to uh, make these computations more efficient. Because doing it directly in n equals eight supergravity is a formidable task. And the bottom line is that through three loops, the uh, n equals eight supergravity uh, amplitude has the same ultraviolet properties in the ultra, as n equals four super Yang mills. So it, it, there's no example yet where, of an amplitude in which this theory behaves any worse. And uh, well, the Kawhi, Llewellyn, and Tai relations are derived from string theory, and their main property is that they are quadratic in the Yang mills amplitude. So they write a gravity amplitude, say four point, five point, or six point, as quadratic combinations of uh, the corresponding Yang-Mills amplitudes. And this whole thing is consistent with the whole product structure of the Fox space. And that means if you know how to do a state sum in n equals four super Yang-Mills, 
you know how to do the corresponding state sum in the more complicated n equals 8 supergravity theory. You uh, basically get to use the same uh, uh, work over again a couple times. I'll just give one graphical example. If suppose you wanted to evaluate this generalized cut in n equals 8 supergravity, you can actually show using the KLT relations and inserting them into these four and five point supergravity trees that things factor into a product of two cuts that you needed for n equals four super Yang mills. So if you know this amplitude, including twisted or non-planar versions, you know how to get this piece of information from this one. And by com combining various combinations of these, you can extract the n equals eight amplitude. You find it depends on just nine integral topologies. Seven of them were known quite a while ago, and two new ones were inferred using techniques like this. And these integrals have various numerator factors. Back uh, a year and a half ago, we wrote down some numerator factors, which I won't uh, read to you, thankfully. And they were quartic in the loop momenta. And now, in a paper to appear in the next week or two, we have uh, rearranged them to make them manifestly quadratic. This doesn't change any of the conclusions of the original paper, but what it does is it, it lets us uh, show that everything's of the same order manifestly as n equals 4 super Yang mills. And the quadratic behavior is because we use these tau variables and we shuffle terms between various integrals. And the reshuffling makes the cancellations more manifest, but it also lets us calculate the uh, divergence in not in four dimensions where the theory is finite, but at six dimensions which is the same place it occurs in n equals four super Yang mills. And we can show that it's non-vanishing, and we'll give the number soon. We can also go beyond three loops. We're working on the four loop calculation, but because I'm out of time, I think I'll just say that uh, it's still, okay, I'll tell you the answer. It's still an open question whether the theory is finite or not. There have been other indications that it should behave well, at least for a while, but, uh, there's no proof yet. There's some indications of ways you might think about proving that it could be finite, which you may hear from Freddie. So in conclusion, let me just say that many calculations of gauge theory scattering amplitudes, which have both practical and formal interest, exploit this plasticity, these various uh, formalisms, and uh, they're leading to practical programs that we hope will be incorporated into next leading order predictions soon. Some of them have for some processes. And they can be applied to these more complicated theories where they're unveiling different kinds of structure. So thanks a lot. guess not. It doesn't show at uh, low orders. The n equals c theory, so it's sort of like the square of n equals 4, but there are these, in the KLT relations, these extra powers of s, and, and when you look at the explicit examples, those extra powers of s completely break this symmetry, so I don't see any reason for it. Also, it includes non-planar graphs, and nobody's identified a meaning for dual conformal invariance for, for non-planar graphs. It might be possible, but this doesn't smell right. Luis. Do you know a way to see if you can guess what the answer would be for more than six legs for the all loop formula for four gluons, for, for, for six or more gluons? Oh, so are you asking uh, how to fix up the onsatz that yes. continues to hold for MHV amplitudes? Well, we're, we're trying to study that question. And uh, one way is to try to work on, so there are, we have integrals. Uh, they're just too complicated to do analytically for the scattering amplitude. There are simpler integrals for the Wilson line case. And uh, well, I've been loaned the use of some of those integrals, so I've been looking at them some, but they're still kind of complicated. And so it's not clear yet. So the first case to study is this six-point case. And, and uh, it might also be possible to use various boundary conditions to try to get a good guess for it. But 
it, it's hard to say yet whether it will be simple enough so that you could then get some insight what happens for the general case. Don't see any more. There's John. Oh, John. John, I'll shout. Uh, I think a, a big style factor should go to the QCD calculation of 4,2 in your global system. Ah, uh, so uh, let's see. That was two loop four point amplitude? Yeah, right. in, in QCD. When you talk about the LHC, you emphasize correctly the importance of getting uh, one loop calculations for background processes. Yeah. Uh, but I think that for purely QCD processes, uh, two loop calculations are going to be extremely important. Yeah, so there, that brings me up to the point that when you go to two loops, there are issues in the real radiation that aren't sorted out yet. And actually, that style factor has already been awarded. There were two groups that did completed those calculations back in about 2000, 2001, the, just the loop part. But because the real radiation problem is so complicated, those loop amplitudes haven't seen the light of day yet. It, you still need to handle uh, issues where you have uh, doubly unresolved radiation. And so there are definitely style factors still to be awarded, but therefore, even grittier work of understanding how to turn this into finite cross-sections. Yeah, I guess that some progress has been made, uh, well, last year, with a complete calculation of E plus minus minus Yeah, minus so, so... Which, parenthetically, is now being used to reanalyze data from the 1990s. Yeah. Uh, but if people could solve the analogous problem for yeah. the NXC, then they really get facts. I like Z plus jets, too, because... All jets is kind of tough to do experimentally, but uh, there are a lot of important, there are, well, there are a few benchmark processes for the LHC, which it would help to have it next to next to leading order, so you really had good control. It's a great point. No more questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again.